Your generous support makes this ministry possible. Thank you. Father, we do thank you for the minds you've given to us. We thank you for the information that you have uh, made available uh, to us as thinking beings uh, in creation, in history, and uh, not least of, in your word. We thank you, Father, that you have spoken, that you have spoken to the ancient uh, peoples, but also to us through those documents. And I thank you, Father, that we can think about where things came from and where they're going and that we can arrive at truth as we will submit that thinking to your revelation. pray that you would help us to understand the courses that uh, our Western thought life have gone through and how that uh, um, has resulted in the way people think today and help us, Father, to be able to intelligently engage them in regard to the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ as you've revealed through your word. So I ask that you direct us today in his name. Amen. Now, we had started on secular humanism. Um, we'll come back to that after the uh, video. But remember, secular humanism, while it is not strictly naturalistic, uh, that leads to nihilism, which you just wrote on today for Sire, um, it does share the uh, assumption that the material universe is all there is, and that therefore everything that that is, is a matter of matter, a matter of the combination of atoms and so forth. The scientific age, which uh, Schaefer is going to take up, um, rests on that same basis, and he will talk about how that naturalistic uh, presupposition led to certain things in regard to humanity. And, uh, and so it'll tie in uh, um, with what we're looking at um, with, uh, with humanism. So we'll look at this, uh, this video first, and then we'll come back to humanism. So, uh, yeah, uh, you know, he's talking about, for then, in 1970, mid-70s, what, where we have come in science and in medicine and so forth, and uh, some of the issues that are raised because of the lack of now a moral, uh, moral base. Um, did you learn from this something uh, other view of science and the origination of science than maybe you uh, were taught in school or you read popularly? For instance, what, Leah? That in, uh, that in like, or any, like Newton, they were all founded on Christianity and that was the basis that they were approaching everything. Yeah. That the men who really began what we would say is the scientific revolution and the foundation of modern science we're not doing it uh, with, the, with the view, with the, with the naturalistic worldview. They were doing it believing in God, but believing that that was the, the, the foundation that made science possible because God had created an orderly universe. Therefore, it could be studied, it could be uh, uh, learned about, and then it could be used for various things. And so I think he well points out, again, from their own writings that... Uh, uh, that they were not pursuing science uh, against uh, religion or against Christianity, but out of it. And I think that is very, very interesting. And, uh, uh, well, what happened to, uh, to result in what we have today as far as a, uh, 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 in the popular mindset, a dichotomy between science and Christianity? What happened? What happened? They viewed man as a machine. Okay, they came to view man as as machine. So um, applying uh, to uh, applying to man, applying to the social realm, 
this idea of a mechanistic universe, which is a philosophical jump. It's not a scientific jump. It's not a jump that is necessitated, but a philosophical one. And so that is important to understand that um, once, uh, once you close the universe, uh, you know, science uh, originating out of Christianity and a Christian mindset, whether or not they were all Christians, they had this idea that, um, that there was a God. And once you close the universe, then man simply becomes part of the physical mechanism. And therefore, you apply to man... Uh, the same uh, principles, the same viewpoint that you would to any other part of the creation. Tinker with it, you know, whatever, whatever can be done uh, can be done. And what he says is man died in this closed system and that there was no place for love or morals or freedom or significance. And you just uh, did the uh, chapter in Sire on nihilism, which is the logical uh, working out of naturalism, which is what this view of a closed universe, a closed mechanistic universe is. And uh, I'm glad we waited till now to see this uh, video because he, he, uh, he brings that together. Uh, what else stuck, stu- stuck out? Stud- what else did you get out of this uh, DVD? <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, Rachel, and then yeah. go ahead, Rachel. I thought it was interesting when you talked about science from the Chinese perspective and the urban system. But yeah. It didn't come to anything because it had the wrong basis. Right, yeah. And, uh, yeah, the whole thing of, of, of cultures like Chinese and Arabic, which had a different view, and he actually quotes uh, uh, a writer that they didn't they didn't have a view of the reliability of the universe because of something there making it reliable so science never really developed yeah, i think that is uh, that is interesting oh, i thought it was interesting when they were talking about like the birds that fall in the water and those ideas sounded like so radical to me and like that they have that they have to have a Right. Yeah, that whole idea, and, and again, in the 70s, he's just kind of projecting where this can go from, our, uh, from a culture's view of man as machine and from the increased ability to manipulate it through sociology, B.F. Skinner, through medicine, through psychology, and so, you know, manipulating the, uh, uh, the machine and all of the suggestions. And yeah, um, we're, we're there in, in many of those regards. Um, and he talked about uh, at the beginning of that segment how the world has come to a place where this, uh, this ability to manipulate an authoritarian manipulation, not militarily or dictatorships that uh, uh, the middle of the uh, 20th century saw, but, uh, but just through knowledge and through control. Well, you know, where we are now compared to then with the Internet and, you know, media and, uh, and that goes, I'm sure, you know, far beyond what Schaefer could even have imagined or even did imagine. But it was, you know, he, uh, he suggested that trajectory, and we've, uh, we've gotten there. Uh, what else stood out? Yeah, and I, and I I've, I've picked up on something. I don't know how many times I've seen this, but he but he talked about legitimacy. He talked about artificial insemination by husband and artificial insemination by donor. And at the time this was made in the 70s, it, that would have actually by law in Britain resulted in an illegitimate child. Is is there any western society that has the concept of illegitimacy anymore? No. It's simply single parent or, you know, it's the condition in which a child, there is absolutely no, uh, no issue of legitimacy. And so you can see that the, um, 
that sociologically the ability to conceive children in different ways has has and, and his point here is is that it it uh, dramatically changes the whole concept of family definition of family so now you can have children uh, don't even have parents and we're talking about test tube babies we're talking about uh, uh, you know non-traditional couples having children through various uh, means you know and, and science is possible therefore it's okay and you notice how in there um, he, he brought brought out the fact that when you lose uh, a moral absolute then the boundary between what you can do and what you should do or shouldn't do is gone and so it's what we can do what we can do we should do and uh, you know there are still those saying wait a minute we can't do everything we can do and yet keeps pushing the envelope and pushing it until you know whatever we can do we should do and so that's uh, you know there is no control on it it's what the majority allows but that's not that's not reliable and that's that's what he's bringing out here is that when you lose the uh, an absolute basis in terms of the personhood of man the dignity of man morals values ethics then then basically it becomes a scientific thing whatever you can do it's okay to do then where does he say we should draw the line at? Well, he basically says that we can't draw the line as a culture unless we go back to the absolutes of the Bible. I mean, that's, that's what he said. And, and in reality, that, that's true. So, I mean, from, from the standpoint of looking at, at history, historically and so forth, I mean, we're headed down a road that we, we can't turn around on and it's going to end in disaster unless there's a revival. But that's the point he makes all through. And remember in the very first video... You know, he, that opening scene with the uh, violence, and he's walking down a street of a major city, and he says, you know, we've come to the place where the, the problems are just, uh, you know, beginning to crush modern man and societies. And he says, you know, where do we turn for help? And he says, well, there's a source that is forgotten about, and he says it's the Bible. And then he goes back to Rome, and he starts tracing it. And that, that really is it. I mean, it's reason or revelation. So um, human beings can draw lines. We need to draw lines. Uh, I think that there is a sense of consciousness that God has put in all human beings and right and wrong. And so people will draw lines even though they do not accept the Bible. And that, that forestalls just a complete breakdown. Uh, but in reality, if you don't go back to the, uh, the only truthful absolute authority we have, you know, the drawing of lines ends up being arbitrary or, you know, by the majority or an elite or whoever's in control. And he's going to explore that on through the rest of the videos. But that's, that's a very interesting question. What else? In Britain in the 1970s, what would it matter if the child was legitimate or not? Well... Um, you know, the history of the West was, you know, just uh, there, would be, there would be rights, there would be rights of inheritance, there would be uh, a certain uh, uh, social stigma, but that, but that, you know, that kind of went along with, uh, uh, with it. Um, but mostly it had to do with, with rights, there would be legal rights um, and so forth. And you see, it's, uh, it's interesting, you, uh, we, we have to maintain the dignity of the individual. So if somebody's born illegitimately, born out of wedlock, uh, you know, still that person should be valued, should be treated as fully human, full dignity. But it does, uh, when it becomes commonplace, then you've redefined marriage, you've redefined the family, and you're significantly altering culture and society. And I think what he would say is, is that the idea of legitimacy comes out of the biblical ethic that lay underneath the Northern Reformation and uh, England and the United States, and that it, it did value marriage and God's definition of a family. So, um, you know, there, there's a various things that, that are involved. But see, the, 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 the very fact that you, and I don't mean you individually, but you as a generation would ask that question shows how far we've come. What's the point of legitimacy or illegitimacy? 
I mean, it's just it's just commonplace. You know, well, who cares where your parents were, where you came from, what your condition was. Um, but that has not been true down through history. Uh, it has it has mattered. And again, while it has resulted in the dehumanizing of people who had no nothing to say about how they came into the world, which is not right, yet it uh, the ignoring of that has shifted uh, significantly uh, the view of of what is a family, what is a society, and and how does it how does it operate? So uh, it, it's it's a very interesting, it's a complex uh, issue. I'd say the changes in generation, like you say, when I was in high school. If a young lady became pregnant, she left school. Now, yeah. that that is just not the case. Anymore. No, now it's almost a neat thing to do. Right. Yeah, and again, you you have to you have to treat the individuals as human beings and love them as Christ did with with people who came to him who were violating social norms, and yet to uh, to approve of it, either tacitly or uh, openly. Uh, does say there are no standards. There, there is no, there is no uh, uh, absolute definition of a family and, and so forth. Uh, but that, that's a, an illustration, and it, it just kind of stuck out to me this time through, that, that issue of legitimacy. We don't even talk about that anymore. And so it, it does, that does illustrate the change in how do you define family? How do you define uh, what is a society? And where does the, uh, uh, where does the ethic come from for it to, to work? And, and then of course, the next thing is, you know, cloning, human cloning, whether or not that's possible, I don't know. Um, if we can do it, we should. Uh, the movie, the, uh, the Island, some of you may have seen, uh, explores that in a very interesting way. Uh, and so, uh, but, but at the heart of all that is the definition of what is human. What is a human being? Machine or a person created in the likeness of God? And, uh, uh, and this is where the, the shift comes in this, uh, this whole thing of, uh, of the scientific view of the universe, naturalistic view of the universe as opposed to a theistic one. Yeah? Do you think that the decline in the value of the family has the decline in the value of the family influenced the decline in the value of individual or vice versa? I'm not sure. And I'm not sure if that's one where you know you can figure out which is the cart and which is the horse, or whether I mean they, they certainly impact each other. Um, I think probably it starts with the individual, and and it's what he says uh, in terms of. Uh, um, once the universe is held to be closed, then each individual is simply a part of the universe. And so man dies. And when man dies, all of the social institutions become meaningless or are redefined. So I, I, think, I think Schaefer would say, and I think uh, that, that it's, it's the individual. Um, uh, and therefore, if the individual is this, then those categories no longer are valid, no longer work. So, no, and so in other words, you've got to start with God, God the individual, then the individual in terms of how God says individuals should be. Um, but that's the first time I've thought about that, per se. Okay, anything, anything else before we move on? Yeah, Jason. Um. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that the Bible is dismissed because people are being taught that there are yeah, things that are absolute that are really theories. Yeah, and, and, and science is the thing. You know, science is objective. Science is truth. Science is the only thing that can give us truth. Those kinds of things are really in the popular mindset. And once you buy into that, then, yeah, the, you've, you've made your decision about what the Bible is. Well, the Bible 
isn't truth. The Bible is philosophy or the Bible is people's ideas or the Bible is mythology. And so I think it's important to understand the proper relationship between science and religion, faith, the Bible. And that's why he starts this with going back to where Western science came from. It did not come out of a hostility to the idea of God or absolutes or Christianity, but it arose out of a positive affirmation of it. Science, science, true science, deals with what is observable and measurable. When it goes beyond that, it's philosophy or religion. And that's why he says what today it's, uh, it's reasonable to say that uh, the new religion is science. And, uh, and that's, you know, that's, that's accurate. So, uh, so true science in terms of the scientific method and who, who started the scientific method? Francis Bacon. And what was Francis Bacon in regard to Christianity? You know, you know he, was, he took the Bible seriously. And uh, um, he was not... Uh, not doing this in distinction to, contradistinction to uh, the Bible as truthful revelation, as truthful, uh, uh, giving truth about the universe. So, um, so that's what we have to understand, that, that scientism is as much a faith commitment and a philosophical position as Christianity. And Christians can involve themselves in science, true science, pure science, because, you know, we're not afraid to look at the universe. We're happy to do that. And uh, um, so I think that is a very important uh, distinction to keep in mind. Also, the interesting thing is, it's at this point in the shift that things like psychology and sociology came to be called sciences, the social sciences. There's a lot in that phrase, that term, as though, you know, now we can objectively, <laughs> you know, manipulate people, psychology and so forth, uh, science. So um, that's uh, with, a new, uh, with a new shift. Now, before that, theology was the queen of the sciences. No, it was the queen of the, yeah. But that was, that was a different understanding, a different usage. Um, so terminology is very important in conditioning our minds. Well, he will continue to develop uh, these ideas and uh, uh, what the, uh, um, yeah, how they're confronted. Uh, so we're currently, we see we're currently in a naturalistic science, like, we're currently in a naturalistic kind of worldview, the world in general. So, I mean, What's next? Nihilism as a like a cultural like whole? Because I mean, cur- like currently culturally, we're not those society. So, do you think that like what's next? Uh, what's next? Um, yeah. Okay. That's. <laughs> That's where we're going with this lecture. All right. I'm I'm trying to decide how much to say now because that's all going to come out in the next ten minutes plus the rest of the semester. Um. Yeah, Sire, Sire is giving you kind of a, uh, an overview of the history of thought. Where we are now is, is what your next chapter in Sire is going to be, and that is existentialism. Where we are now, and when we're, we're talking here about theism, or we're talking about humanism, is how has humanity, how has the non-believing world, how has the scientific, naturalistic world uh, addressed the problem of nihilism, the problem of the meaningless, the lack of significance, the death of life that man as machine naturally produces. So, um, so... The answer to that is, is existentialism, and everything from that point on is some form of existentialism, and that is tr- man trying to reintroduce meaning and therefore reintroduce value and ethic and direction, but not from a theistic basis. 
So th- there is no next step in that sense, uh, unless you think postmodernism, and that's what he will say is, is that we eventually got to postmodernism where there is no drive for meaning, there is no quest for truth, just everybody becomes truth unto themselves. That is the end game. But while people might hold that philosophically, they still live as some sort of existentialist in defining, determining meaning and significance for myself. So from that point on, it's all sort of uh, variations on the theme. And, and I think that'll, that'll, we'll see that as we uh, carry on through the semester. Okay, let's, um, let's go back to your notes on humanism. Yeah, we just have done the first page of notes here on humanism, which just kind of talks about the term. We've had a, given a definition that, uh, that it's a general worldview that stresses the worth, dignity, and capability of mankind apart from any outside person or force accounting for all things on a natural, that is an anti-supernatural basis. And um, because there is a very definite... Uh, a definite group of, uh, uh, that calls themselves uh, the, the uh, American Humanist Association, I've uh, just started with, um, with that document. I want to finish that today, or try to finish it today. And um, this was the, uh, uh, the opening statement, and I've just gone and, and given you exactly what, uh, what we have here. Um, so uh, they... Uh, they come from the same basis as, you know, uh, scientific naturalists, some of whom are very hostile, but, um, uh, but they're, not, uh, they're not trying to, to uh, destroy everything and dissolve everything. We've looked at the first uh, three uh, paragraphs, I think. Knowledge of the world is derived by observation, experimentation, and rational analysis. And this is what we just considered in the uh, Schaefer a video in terms of uh, um, it being a, a basically a scientific naturalism foundation. Um, and we had looked at this one, that ethical values are derived from human need and interest as tested by experience. And this, uh, this has to do with uh, existentialism, which you will uh, cover next in Sire's treatment in which it's recognized that there is no ground for meaning in scientific naturalism. Therefore, man has to establish it from within himself, from the starting point of his own existence. Therefore, existentialism. Got that? (laughs) Existentialism comes from existence. I am. And so I'm going to start with meaning from my existence rather than God's, okay? So that basically is the idea of existentialism. It's how to put meaning back into a meaningless world that is what uh, a purely mechanistic, the world is a machine, view leads to. And that's what you just read about in nihilism. So... um, so that's, you know, humanism is the street version of this. It's, it's how people conceive of this. And so there are going to be ethics and ethical values. Now, did we, did we start this one? I think we did. Life's fulfillment emerges from individual participation in the service of humane ideals. We aim for fullest possible development and animate our lives with a deep sense of purpose finding wonder and awe in the joys and beauties of human existence, its challenges and tragedies, and even in the inevitability and finality of death. Humans rely on the rich heritage of human culture and the life stance of humanism to provide comfort in times of want and encouragement in times of plenty. So it is uh, stated in their uh, philosophy, in their, uh, their basic ideas, that this is a positive view of life. It's affirming life uh, as purposeful, as enjoyable, as having significance, even though death is the final act, even in the face of the finality of death. 
And so it is a, a, an awareness of the fact that death is the end. This is the view of naturalism. Uh, the body, uh, the person is a result of the physical uh, body and the, uh, um, the interaction of physical elements. And once that body ceases to exist, it decays and so forth, the person ends. And so this life is what is, is to be had. But unlike the nihilist, there is an affirmation of the positive meaning and value of life. And, uh, and this comes, uh, again, from the fact uh, that, well, you know, naturalism is not livable with its uh, logical conclusions. And so we'll come back to evaluate this in terms of, uh, of a complete worldview. Does this really answer the issues of life? Now, the next paragraph, humans are social by nature and find meaning in relationships. Remember we said in Christian theism that one of the uh, ramifications of being created uh, uh, in God's likeness is that we are uh, we're social. We have the desire, the need, the capacity for community. And uh, uh, humanists um, uh, affirm this as well. Humanists long for and strive toward a world of mutual care and concern, free of cruelty and its consequences, where differences are resolved cooperatively without resorting to violence. The joining of individuality with interdependence enriches our lives, encourages us to enrich the lives of others, and inspires hope of attaining peace, justice, and opportunity for all. So these uh, are, they're, they're usually have a very peace-oriented uh, outlook. And they will look at Christian groups who are not this, who think, you know, they ought to go around wrecking havoc, and mayhem because uh, of all of the bad things that their humanists are doing. And they'll say, who's the group of love, us or them? And so, uh, you know, you will find uh, this, this very uh, concerted uh, uh, effort in terms of the betterment of humanity um, in peaceful ways. And so there, there is a high ethical desire here. Now the question we all have to ask is, does it naturally arise from their base, all right? And is it workable? Is, is actually their goals achievable through this? So, um, uh, so this is an expression of, of what they desire. It's an expression of what we desire, all right? Uh, next to the last uh, uh, fundamental uh, uh, statement, working to benefit society maximizes individual happiness. Progressive cultures have worked to free humanity from the brutalities of mere survival and to reduce suffering, improve society, and develop global community. We seek to minimize the inequities of circumstance and ability and we support a just distribution of nature's resources and the fruits of human effort so that as many as possible can enjoy a good life. Well, yeah, that sounds like, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, agenda of a lot of, lot of groups uh, that we would look at and say, well, they're, you know, they're goody-goody, but they don't really take realities of life uh, to heart and so forth. But they do point to the fact that uh, there has been progress in the human race that uh, there are many countries where, you know, there is not war. You don't have to walk around, you know, uh, fearful of everything. Uh, maybe not in every community, but in countries. That societies have been improved. That there is a sense of, you know, the global community coming together. Now, the thing that we would probably say is, yeah, but you're ignoring a lot of the bad stuff too. Are we really on an upward trajectory? Or when you take everything together, <laughs> is the world more coming apart? Is there more, is, you know, is violence increasing faster than goodness? So uh, again, it's, it's, it's what parts you take and how you integrate the totality that we will have to examine. And also notice here that um, the goal is not just individual salvation or 
individual, you know, going beyond. It's humanity. And so what we will see is, is that the hope of humanism lies not in the eternal extension of life for the individual. It lies in the continuation of the human race and the ultimate betterment of the human race. When I die, I'll be gone. What I can contribute in terms of the longevity and positiveness after I'm gone is whatever I can do to help humanity along while I'm here in terms of the betterment of humanity and so forth. So you can see that while it recognizes that we're only here for the amount of our physical life, there is no individual hope of, of salvation or life beyond, there is a positive view of life, a desire to live life uh, in a fulfilled way. Um, it, it, does have, it does have the limitation of naturalism that it's the it's the it's man as machine that is the finality of of the individual so the final two two paragraphs humanists are concerned for the well-being of all are committed to diversity and respect those of differing yet humane views we work to uphold the equal enjoyment of human rights and civil liberties in an open secular society and maintain that it is a civic duty to participate in the democratic process and a planetary duty to protect uh, nature's integrity, diversity, and beauty in a secure, sustainable manner. Now, this is the third version of the uh, Humanist Manifesto. I'm sure that the first one, written in 1933, didn't have the emphasis on the environment and so forth that this one has. Yeah, but again, as we become more globally aware, as we become uh, you know, more aware of how our living impacts others in terms of, of health and so forth, you know, these issues come more to the consciousness of human beings, and to their credit, they're trying to address them. The question will be, can they really address them in the, uh, in the terms of, of what is ultimately hoped for? Thus engaged in the flow of life, we aspire to this vision, and with the informed conviction that humanity has the ability to progress toward its highest ideals. The responsibility of our lives and the kind of world in which we live is ours and ours alone. And uh, this, this will be, you know, the, the key then, the key of humanism with regard to the human being is that humanity has the ability to progress toward its highest ideals. And of course, as Christian theists, we say, well, we really don't by ourselves. Ultimately, we can't solve the problems. It's, uh, it's God who is there who is who's going to, uh, uh, to take us uh, where we need to go. But I want you to see that it does affirm a positive view of life. It's not a hedonistic thing. Ah, we're just here to have fun and because we're going to die. And uh, There is a purposefulness to us. There is a great sacrifice that many people go through in order to live this way. And, uh, and yet it is, uh, you know, it has the downside of it's just this life. It's only this life. And so we will examine uh, the claims to whether or not this is a sufficient worldview, whether it's a complete worldview, after we have looked at its, uh, at its tenets uh, uh, according to the different categories.